So this is kind of turned into something different where I am ad hoc giving a presentation. Um, oh, really quick, did, did <laughs> anyone uh, get the urge to share? I, I know, is Shirley there? Is yeah, she's there? right back there. Okay, yeah, I, I know you surely wanted to share something. Any, did anyone else have, uh, I know a lot of you guys are working on uh, graph visualizations. If you want, in a minute, we'll have a little time to come up and share. But. Go ahead. All right, so graph prism is another way of visualizing a network. Basically, when you start getting to that bound of usefulness uh, of visualizing a network in a force-directed graph or anything, anything that's like representing the graph as a whole, and you get to this hairball effect that a lot of uh, people end up getting to, because uh, this data makes sense to me and just kind of looks pretty to everyone else. Um, it's it the usefulness is completely shot. You can't really understand what's going on at a macro or even micro level. So a lot of the visualizations we've seen really promote uh, a micro level understanding of uh, of a graph. So you're exploring the data in very interesting ways. Elijah's uh, talk really covers it beautifully, and I really like his implementation. But Graph Prism is taking it more from a, a uh, macro level that is uh, no longer visualizing a graph uh, in a uh, local state, or rather edges to nodes, uh, but as a global state. So taking some uh, values in network science and visualizing those to better understand and classify the behaviors of uh, certain graphs. Uh, this is, again, my interpretation of a paper that I was reading uh, just a little bit ago. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so to, deep, uh, to dive deep into this a little bit, uh, when you're visualizing uh, using this technique, you have a lot of values that represent uh, uh, like th things that describe a graph or describe the structure of a graph. Uh, some of the network science things are connectivity, so how connected a uh, an individual uh, edge is, the, or degree. Uh, the diameter, which is the length of the maximum shortest path between any pair of connected nodes in G. Uh, a triad, which is just a triplet uh, of connected nodes. Transitivity uh, locally and globally. There's also some other things, um, but for this implementation of a global representation of a graph, they didn't really dive into those other uh, values. So taking these data points, which if you think about it, are going to be across some numerical plane or new numerical dimension, uh, and quantifying and comparing the, uh, them across the graph is what makes for an interesting description of uh, the global state of the graph. So uh, the example, which was, from my understanding, a, uh, a like introduction, like what brought uh, Graph Prism to be uh, implemented is this B ma matrix, uh, which a B matrix um, takes uh, represents the number of nodes which can fit, uh, can reach k other nodes in exactly l hops. So that takes, th so you have some value b k l um, here, and quantifies it by the number of nodes in that uh, view. And since you have a matrix, you can create a histogram or a heat map on that matrix uh, using colors. This is just a very simple uh, visualization. They made it a little prettier because uh, this is Stanford, and yeah, um, and they worked to leverage a lot of the uh, values that network science are using, visualizing them on a, at a global state, and then building an interac uh, interaction and, and uh, compare like a way to compare them. Uh, in this case, this is small multiples, so you can instantly see. Um, Graph one, graph two, graph three, graph th four, graph five, graph six. They all have different behaviors, but they all uh, like uh, graph five and graph six. They uh, have a very unique, 
or like very similar transitivity uh, in, uh, in that it looks similar, at least to my eyes. And I'll zoom in for those who can't see. But um, yeah, so my, my interpretation of this is that this is a great first uh, step into visualizing are uh, visualizing graphs at a global state rather than a local state. And I really like to see others' opinions uh, and how it's valuable. Um, and does anyone have any thoughts? This is meant to be a discussion, so. Um. Um, I, I'm confused on what you mean uh, by global state and local state, particularly as it pertains to uh, these large-scale, I guess, networks. Can you describe some of the details? Um, I, I think maybe maybe it's a, and it looks like maybe what's going on here is you're seeing the distribution of values for all the nodes for yes. various nodes. Well, statistics. it's actually the distribution of nodes on the set of values. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this so, is like this is like a histogram of. Yeah, so it's a two-dimensional histogram or a heat map. You can zoom in on the histogram. Yeah. This looks like it's on line somewhere. I see that GUI up there. Huh. This looks like it's a web I have not been able to find it. Okay. If you can find it, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this. Uh, do you know what? Do you know what this? What this y -X, Like what the difference is? So, the, so each each one. So this is a very, from my interpretation of, uh, designed for the expert user. That is somebody that knows what each thing corresponds to and how the representative state of the graph looks. So. I don't know each individual one, but uh, if we step through the connectivity, that was the um, that was that B matrix that we looked at, I believe. So that's classifying the the reach to k other nodes in exactly L hops. So how how connected each uh, like uh, so for example, the this uh, graph right here has a really low connectivity and a really high connectivity, um, right? Yeah. Uh, Does those they group somehow and then presented connectivity of groups? Um, so there, no, it's, so it's on the numerical axis. So the, the data is actually in, in the domain of what the data, the, like what the actual values of the calculations are not in the other direction. So the nodes are like they just count the nodes, or uh, in this case that are that have high connectivity, or like high uh, high number of L hops and a uh, uh, or yeah, I'm butchering this, but yes, in a way, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this the visualization here is really fascinating. I, I feel like there'd be a number of uh, other directions you can take this one. One that comes to mind is uh, comparing networks as a whole. So mm -hmm. you could compare um, uh, my disease spread networks with uh, and, uh, uh, reference networks, and you know, or, and, and see what characteristics of the network uh, are in common. Um, another is you might be able to pull interesting uh, sub sub networks out of the network and see if there's say a department within a that has a different structure than the network as a whole. Mm -hmm. you know, th certain things like that, I, I think you could explore in, in ways we haven't been able to dig into networks very easily before. Yep. I think uh, this metadata meta is probably useful when the graph is alive when, when the data is growing. So you can see how the connectivity and those characteristics uh, change and probably make some make some something out of it. I mean, I I definitely agree with everyone, uh, what everyone has been saying. I really hope that after just telling people about this paper, that maybe they find the implementation, post it on some forum somewhere, and I and everyone starts using this representation because realistically, uh, hearing over and over again, 100 nodes, 500 nodes, whatever whatever your bound is on a visualization, uh, isn't enough for me. I'd rather start thinking of aggregating or uh, uh, like you see a lot now in scatter plots being aggregated into these 
hexagonal binning systems to deal with performance issues. Um, that's my personal view is that this is how we should be dealing with uh, complex and high dimensional uh, networks. Um, so I hope everyone starts hacking. We only need to you know, write the algorithm once and then just put in a function that everyone else can use. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, my impression is this stuff is really useful if you want to understand structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, like you can have two graphs that when you display them in force director or something, there are, you know, lots of edges and links that have the same, you know, average number, average node degree or something. You know, but the distribution of node degree is very different. Or you can even have two graphs that have very similar distribution of node degree, but then like the next level in complexity of the metric, I can't remember what it's called, but like do nodes of degree five tend to connect to other nodes of degree five, or they tend to connect to a lot of nodes of degree one or degree two or something. So these sort of building up of each of these individual metrics of in complexity of, and sort of like aggregate view of the overall structure of the, of the network so you can understand if this network is similar to this one or not, and, and each of these metrics have like properties associated with them in terms of you know, how small world they are, you know, how, you know, how easy it is to get to anybody else, and that sort of stuff. So given that, what, if you know those two, property, uh, those two things share a property, do you, do you think if you had an understanding of what that property was, it could tell you something that some are you just making a correlation, or is it going to be something that you're going to be able to make action on that, or understand the why of these the the similarity? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think so. I think okay. so. You know, it's like you can. I don't know how far away is far away. You know, these sort of small world properties of. Uh, you know, we. You know, we want to know if this guy is only two hops away from the bad guy, or whatever. But it turns out everybody's two hops away from the bad guy, or three hops, or, or whatever. So, um, yeah. Well, it seems to me graph prism, it eats your whole network, and then it sort of says, hmm, fruity with a little earthiness <laughs> to it. Mm -hmm. And so it has these properties that it can abstract. But from a data visualization perspective, does this tell you anything about your data? And point. it tells you about your network, but does it tell you anything about the data? And maybe in some cases it does, but that's not obvious to me. So um, just out of curiosity, what, uh, what is the distinction between a network and the data itself? Because to me, that network is, in a way, part of the data. Well. For example, um, in Kindred Britain, Elijah showed us all kinds of representations. Some were more revealing about the British elites mm -hmm. than others. Okay. And so the question is, where would this fall on that spectrum of revealing versus totally opaque? Okay, that makes sense. Uh, you know, maybe maybe you could tell you something about the difference between the structure of the leaps social networks and peasant social networks, and to what degree their structures are related somehow in this kind of very high level way. So, I mean, it's it is a form of aggregation. So, a lot of a lot of visualizers hate aggregating, um, in sometimes a necessary evil. Uh, I think. Maybe the, maybe not this specific aggregation is the right one, but I I would like to see more explora exploration of aggregated visualizations on top of networks that are maybe not hierarch hierarchical binning. So, one of the one of the things that you were sort of alluding to earlier there was that you saw what you kind of saw as a kind of a a, sig a common signature between two uh, different sets of data uh, over the right there, and. So it, it seems to me that you know one of the things that this thing is doing is it's bringing out certain abstract characteristics of the graph, and that could be of subsets of the graph, 
either by type of connectivity or by clusters. And you could imagine doing some kind of analysis to say, you know, what, what, you know, how can you, how can you, for instance, say, you know, these these parts of the graph here have the same kind of cluster, uh, structure as each other, and, and then you could look at that and say, well, what is that? Does that tell us anything, or is it just a coincidental kind of a, a thing? So it, it might very well tell you stuff that you couldn't see from the graph itself. All right, thanks, Miles. Um, I give it for Miles. Quick, quick summary. Um, I work at a company called Splunk, and a couple months ago, oh, we're a big data company, and a couple months ago, we got to partner up with jQuery and kind of um, uh, track the data of uh, their Portland conference. Um, and so we went in and say tracked uh, click events on say programs or talks or speakers and hover events and all of those client side events, ported it over to our software Splunk um, and then uh, indexed and analyzed the data and then we went and made a visualization. Um, and I got really excited about this because this was our quote unquote side project. Um, and uh, so this is the result of what happened. Um, and to start off, um, we, uh, there were some questions that we wanted to answer for the uh, jQuery conference. Um, some of the things are like, what are the talks that visitors are interested in? Um, where are the uh, tickets being purchased from? And how do the visitors spend time on the page? Um, and so you can see this is kind of the, the data that we aggregated. Uh, oh, so uh, so for example, on the I'm really bad at left and right. Sorry, on the left side is uh, the number of clicks, um, click event on a talk description, and on the right hand side is the number of clicks on a speaker description. Um, so you can see, um, and there are there. So depending on jQuery was um, given the talk was given by Alex Sexton. And so you can see a corresponding, um, I guess, like a kind of like a quote unquote popularity. Um, and uh, we, you know, this is a funnel, uh, funnel view of say, uh, like what, um, where did a particular purchase come from? So apparently um, 9,000 or so page views um, led to 18 purchases from um, directly from jQuery, somewhere from Google, from somewhere from events.jQuery and such. Um, and finally, a, um, a chart on how people are interacting with the site. Um, some people, so how are they, uh, like what are the sections that they're looking, on, uh, looking at? Like are they looking at the program descriptions, uh, the training sections, the speaker sections, um, and et cetera. So uh, we had a, a lot of fun implementing this, um, and I just glazed over all of this. Sorry, like, um, but uh, we uh, we had a lot of fun with this, um, and but then there were some shortcomings. Like we really only had data to pull for a week, so a lot of this, um, like all of this, is based on one week's worth of data, which is, as you might know, not like not a very representative pool uh, to be visualizing this. But the important thing that we learned from it is um, that it is one possible. Um, and two, uh, we tried to make this into a living infographic, uh, meaning that we were trying to update these data and these uh, visualizations live. Um, since then, because the jQuery conference has been over, we've made it static. Um, but um, the the uh, the library to um, track the information and then port it over to Splunk has been made public on our Splunk GitHub, so that anybody can uh, plop the library into their own website and then write up some scripts about uh, some events that they want to track, and then they can port it over to Splunk and then. Um, make these visualizations themselves very with with um, existing libraries like jQuery and Backbone and D3. Um, oh, the the library, uh, it's uh, sb.js. Um, I think it might be currently called something like a 
demo library for uh, for something collector, but it's it's on the uh, if you search for a Splunk GitHub, it's it's on there, um, and uh, it's a. Uh, I wanted to show this just to have a conversation maybe afterwards about um, things that could take advantage of this um, in the sense that uh, I've been, it, I mean, it's, it's a, it, it, like uh, things that could use this to uh, create kind of a real time infographic um, and maybe like some, some sort of a collaboration or I just actually had a question on the, the last visualization you saw. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a clip screen visualization, right? I don't know. I just kind of came up with it. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> is this all the possible sets of clip screens, or is it the top K and? Oh, sorry. Uh, what do you mean by click clicks? So, so Yes, so different um, events that we tracked. Uh, so for example, the circles are click events, um, but the uh, rectangles are how long um, they've stayed within a particular section within the website. Okay. Yeah. So uh, can you uh, go about this, like how did you design this and what was the, where did you pull your? Actually, yeah, um, that's actually a, a very interesting question that I had some bit of a trouble with. Um, because uh, when we were collecting these data, one of the things that I wanted to figure out was how would I show um, anybody how a group of, of people were interacting with the site. So originally I actually wanted to figure out how to display an aggregation or maybe an average of um, how people were interacting with the site. Perhaps um, aggregated by maybe the num the length of time that people were spending in the section training or something and then the like the most common pattern that that people were having um, I couldn't figure out how to aggregate it well and so this is what happened the the two things I wanted to know which was um, how were people spending their time and what kind of links were they interested in and um, and then another question I wanted to know was um, how did a person determined to purchase a ticket. So for all of these um, uh, swim lanes, they all end up with a purchase. Um, and so you can see this person clicked on, the last couple things that they did was click the link buy tickets, obviously, and then it, uh, it directed them to Eventbrite and had a success. Um, and then before then, apparently they were clicking around on they were looking into the program, and then they were looking at the tickets section for a couple seconds, and they were looking at the program again. So apparently they went in between tickets and programs a lot, and sometimes training. And then the hope in building this was that the next time jQuery had a um, conference, they could kind of see what kind of, what is the user, um, the common user interaction and then that way maybe they can lay out their web page in a way that's more intuitive for the user. Or perhaps um, which buy buttons were the more noticeable or the ones that were clicked on most. Or, um, and so those were some of the business insights that we were trying to gather. So does it also allow people also use uh, you know, Google Analytics and stuff? So does it work with that too? Yeah, so I believe, um, I mean, okay, so, so Splunk itself, um, you just pour in any data and you configure it and then it indexes it for you so that you can um, search for any data you want. So all this is doing is using the, um, the library that we wrote to port some information into Splunk directly and then we just um, gave it some search terms and then um, those search terms gave us back the JSON results that we used to visualize this. So um, if you have Google Analytics, you can, as long as it has like some sort of a JSON out output, XML output, you can port it over to Splunk and then visualize it. Um, another reason we decided to do this visualization is because we wanted to show people that um, to make any sort of visualization within Splunk, you can just um, use currently existing JavaScript libraries. It's very easy to do. Are you going like directly, like, 
So are you using the data like directly out of Splunk to compare the visualization or is it mm -hmm. like intermediate steps or something? No, it's just directly from Splunk, yeah. So I'm still not clear, like why would somebody use, let's say you said that there's a JSON, like a blob from Google Analytics or somewhere, mm -hmm. and why would somebody go through Splunk, why wouldn't they just use some D3 like library and just plot it out? You can. Um, we just uh, provide a really good, um, we, we just uh, index the data in a way that if you say have, for example, I think this had 10,000 or a couple, you know, 10,000s of events. And so if you have, when you have a data set that's that large um, and you don't want to, say, write anything of your own to go through that data, Splunk is a very good alternative. I guess you could kind of imagine this data. I mean, these users are kind of like, it's kind of like if the users are nodes in the graph, and these, these pages are also nodes, and the users have relationship to these, to these uh, sections of pages, which are also nodes. These are alleged. So there's some, the edge is like some length of time you spent here. And if you did a force directed algorithm, you would get all the pages that people spent time together, like kind of uh, all questions. Actually, it would be really cool. Because there's always this equivalency between nodes and edges. You can always kind of flip them around and visualize all the edges as the nodes, which is kind of what's happening here if you think about it one way. Yeah. I'm going to think about that. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, sorry. Uh, when Splunk started out several years ago, your, your, your focus was log analysis. Mm -hmm. That's still what you're, OK. I'm just thinking that uh, if you're not already doing this, it might be interesting for you to try and promote some kind of D3-based visualization into your core competency of log analysis and uh, see, see if you can get your user community to, to exchange uh, tools that they come up with. Oh, yeah. So we actually, uh, this is now not about this visualization anymore, but we actually do have um, AppStar coming out um, that are basically, we we uh, create visualizations with D3, and then we um, bundle them and we ship them so that you can just uh, plop it into your own uh, Splunk dashboard um, with the data you have. So we have like the force directed diagrams, and um, we have uh, uh, the sunbursts, and a lot of the D3 visualizations. We've uh, made it in a way that's uh, really easily adaptable within the Splunk dashboard. Right, I'm just going to step in here. So we have a couple minutes to just socialize and talk to each other before we got to be out of here at night. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, one question. Uh, so he mentioned log analysis that I'm really curious now. What, so because log files, you know, as far as I've, I'm, I've uh, you know, been programming, I just like, they're garbage. We don't look at it. So what kind of log files do you uh, work with and uh, what do you do with that? Oh, we, we should take this Yeah, we'll, we'll take it offline, yeah. <laughs> So thank you all for coming out. Thanks to our great speakers. Thank you.